Hey folks, I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to another shorty. Subsequently, welcome to the second part of our very brief history of Spider-Man in comic book form. So, after the Green Goblin, who's next on our list? Well, how about that tentacle terror of Dr. Otto Octopus Octavius? Dr. Octopus appeared long before even Norman Osborn, making his debut in July of 1963. Otto Octavius, having suffered at the hands of an abusive father, finally made good when he got his nuclear physics degree. Dr. O even developed a set of remote nuke-proof prosthetic arms to help in his research. But one night, a terrible accident changed his fate. Thus, Dr. Octopus was born. Spider-Man has battled this tentacle terror on and off for over half a century now, and more recently Octavius has found himself in Spidey's body. The superior Spider-Man lasted 33 issues, and told the tale of how Octavius tried to surpass Peter Parker's legacy, and Dr. Octopus's criminal past. Eventually, Peter regained his own mind, and Spider-Man was superior no more. Dr. Octopus was also a founding member of the Sinister Six, a recurring loose-knit affiliation of supervillains, all with a grudge against Spider-Man. The first instance of such a grouping was in 1964, when Octavius collected Electro, the Electric-Powered Crook, Craven the Hunter, a Russian Tracker, the Vulture, an inventor whose flight harness granted him great strength, the Sandman, who's made of sand due to a nuclear accident, and Mysterio, Master of Illusion, in order to defeat, or even destroy, Spider-Man. Needless to say, they were less than successful. The group would reappear several times, always being defeated by Spider-Man, occasionally with the help of a reformed Sandman, or super teams such as the Avengers or Fantastic Four. Dr. Octopus and the Green Goblin Our friendly neighbourhood Spider-Man may have had trouble in defeating them, but at least he could see them coming. With the vicious and violent Venom, however, it was a different story. After the iconic crossover event Secret Wars, Spider-Man returned to Earth with an all-new black costume. This costume, however, was a symbiotic organism that sought to bond with Peter, but he was having none of it, and used a church bell to be rid. Finding a new host in recently disgraced rival Eddie Brock, Venom was born. Eventually, similar loud sounds were used to divest Brock of the Venom symbiote, but this was not the end of the story. Indeed, the history of Venom, his lineage and legacy, and all the hosts that the Venom symbiote has bonded with, would take another shorty to even summarise. Instead, let us turn our attention to the mid-1990s and a cautionary tale of cloning technology, and the chaos it can bring. Beginning in October of 1994, the Clone Saga had its roots in a 1973 story where Miles Warren, alias the Jackal, had gone crazy in the wake of Gwen Stacy's death. He created a clone of Gwen alongside one of Peter Parker. Of course, this led to a shocking revelation and motivated the Jackal to revenge against Spider-Man. The two Spider-Men are forced to fight but eventually team up. Sadly, the clone is killed in an explosion, which also ends the Jackal. Or so we think, until October of 1994, when it is revealed that the clone survived. Taking the name Ben Riley for Ben Parker and Aunt May's maiden name Riley, this clone changed his appearance subtly and would use the alias of the Scarlet Spider. Thus, for a staggering 26 months, Spider-Man and the Scarlet Spider would endure madness, weirdness, and an overlong narrative that carried Marvel Comics through its darkest days. But as controversial and shocking as the Clone Saga was, there was another event in the mid-2000s that divided opinion even further. In the wake of mid-2000s crossover Civil War, Aunt May had been shot, and her survival was in doubt. Enter Mephisto, ruler of the Marvel metaphysical underworld, who offers to save Aunt May in return for erasing the relationship between Peter and MJ from existence. Our hero was given one more day to decide. Eventually, he took up Mephisto's offer. This made a lot of people very angry and stopped reading Spider-Man comics altogether. 
But the idea of Spider-Man is bigger than just one man. Gather round, my friends, and hear the tale of Miles Morales. In 2011, it was decided that the Ultimate Universe needed a shaker, and that the Ultimate Peter Parker was to die. In his place, a new protagonist, one Miles Morales, would take up the mantle. However, being that Morales has only been a protagonist for about four years our time, he has yet to build any sort of legend for himself. And there's so much more I've missed out on. Yes, for over half a century, a young man in a tightly fitting, brightly coloured suit swinging around New York has enthralled generations, while being a symbol of the struggle of youth to make their way in the world. And whatever you think of Peter's deal with the devil, I recommend checking out The Adventures of Spider-Man, old or new. I've been Funky Monkey, and you've been watching another House of Love shorty. So long.